Okay, folks, it is time for our third session in the newcomer track. Um, so far, we've kept up our end of the bargain on making sure that all these sessions in this track are epic. And I'm going to keep saying this, but this session is going to be none other than epic. Kurt is going to be presenting about leveraging visual and functional best practices for actionable power gap. So it's actually a non-technical talk, and it's diving into a few of the psychological things as well of how you can visualize your data and how you can make sure that your people effectively see the, the message that you're trying to get across. But I'm not going to take up too much time because with this, Kurt, it is up to you. Good luck, have fun, relax, and don't forget to breathe. Thank you. Thank you, Benny, for the introduction, and thank you to the organizers for putting this all together and giving me the chance to tell this story. So, as Benny said, uh, we're going to be discussing how to design effective Power BI reports so that users can easily find and seek what they need, but also so that we can design something that a user will actually use. So, we're going to be using a hypothetical business case to illustrate some of the concepts we'll talk about today. And we're going to be aided with the help of this individual that we'll get to know very well. But more about him later, because now it's time to talk about reports. When a user arrives at your Power BI report, in three seconds, they have to be able to have the most critical facts. In 30 seconds, be able to filter and zoom to what's important to them. And in 300 seconds, be able to seek details on demand that they can use to take action. If they can't do any of these things, then you've lost the user. Your report is another that misses the mark and it will end up on the pile of those who came before it. That is of course not what we want. So how do we avoid it? In this talk, I'll be telling you about a principle we can use to design effective reports known as the information seeking mantra. What this means is that designing reports that provide a three second overview of the most overview and uh, critical information before allowing the users in 30 seconds to be able to filter and zoom to what's important to them. And in 300 seconds, being able to pull out details on demand using interactions like cross filtering and drilling down. In order to do this, we have to leverage best practices visual best practices so that we can design charts that are effective and functional best practices so that we can lay them out in an effective way in our report and also make good use of the interactions that we have at our disposal. But best practices are not all that we need. What we also need is to have user design co-creation. What this means is that first understanding who the users are having a discussion with them and understanding what they do before working with the users in an iterative agile way to design something that comes much closer toward the target than if we were to have done the whole design and development process in a vacuum. To illustrate these concepts, as I mentioned before, we're going to be using a hypothetical business case of a B2B and B2C distribution company. They've set up a pretty impressive architecture. They've invested heavily in BI, and they've started looking at Power BI and how they can set up Power BI sales operational reporting. But first, a little bit about me. As you might hear from my accent, I am originally from Canada. I've been living in Belgium since 2012 and been working at Ardina since 2018 at, as a data visualization consultant. My hobbies include visualizing and working with data as well as inline skating and, as you might have guessed, tabletop role-playing games. The latter of which is relevant for us, yes, because today we're going to do some role-playing as a business user. Our business case, as a level 11 sales director, we've been happily employed in our company, the only e-commerce business with airship cross-continental delivery from coast to coast. What is our company? We are Dumbledilps Advent Equipment and Adventuring Deliveries Incorporated, better known by our acronym, DEAD. Our business is that we sell and ship ad uh, adventuring equipment and supplies globally to customers. Things are moving extremely fast. Last year, we had booming growth, really record-breaking. But this year, 
things are not going nearly as well. In fact, we're struggling and we don't really know how or why. So we've been looking into Power BI reporting. Specifically, we've decided that what we need are good operational reports to help us run our sales organization. But what we want is, of course, to use these reports to make data-driven decisions that help us sell more products to more customers. We are ready for our first Power BI reports. Klonk, our resident data goblin, has volunteered to design the first draft. He's very excited, very motivated, and sits down with the executives for the first requirements gathering meeting. He gets out his notepad and starts scribbling down fervently as our first dashboard starts to come into fruition. As the executives explain to Clonk what they want to see, they put forward the requirements. They say, Clonk, we want to be able to see these KPIs. We have to see our gross profit and we need to be able to see value in units. We also have to see our net profit. He nods, he writes it down. As she says, Clonk, we have to also compare to last year. This is our main target and it's important that we get a really high level overview of how we're doing. He nods, he continues writing. As uh, she explains, yeah, we need to be able to split all of this data by our most important categories, like our customer and our product hierarchies, for example. We really need to have this data split by all of these. So he nods, he, he's ready to do this. And uh, as the meeting concludes, he's ready to go. He doesn't have a lot of experience with Power BI, but he's highly motivated and he knows there's a lot of learning resources out there. So he buries himself in his office, puts his nose to the grindstone, and gets working. Data and charts are flying this way and that as he works late into the night to design the first draft. He thinks he's come up with something that could work. It's been a bit of a long and arduous climb, but he's got something to show. So remember, we as sales directors, as business users, have some questions that we need to answer with these reports. When we look at these reports, we should be able to extract some very important information. The most basic of which is how much have we made so far this year and are we doing better than last year? In fact, this is information that we should be able to pull out of the report in three seconds or less. So let's look at Klonk's first draft and see if we can answer these questions in the three seconds or less. How much have we made so far this year and are we doing better than last year? Ready? This is Klong's first report. Three seconds are up. I'm sure you're still processing the red. But in case you haven't noticed it, uh, this critical information is buried in this table in the middle on the right hand side. So, of course, we all know that this dashboard, it was rejected. It wasn't very effective. And why? The main reason and the feedback the executives give is that the report doesn't follow any data visualization best practices. In fact, to be specific, there is an overuse of red, something that's very overwhelming and has an implicitly uh, negative association. Next, the chart layout is just ineffective and the chart choices as well, which makes it difficult for us to be able to find anything also because the view is very cluttered. There's a lot of ink and we're just very overwhelmed when we arrive at this report. Even if we do think we find something, it's hard for us to understand because it's just not very clear. It's not very accessible. Things aren't labeled so well or there's labels missing entirely. We waste a lot of time thinking about what we're looking at. So Klonk, he's, uh, he's a good sport and he's ready to receive this feedback as he sits down with one of the executives and she explains to him some of these things. and. So how can Clonk do better? Well, first he can understand that red has an implicitly negative association in Western cultures. So we should use it to grab attention. We should use it to call out things like, for example, if we're missing our targets and we should use the implicit encoding that cultures have in the context in which we're working. Next, Clonk should understand that again, in the West, we typically read from top left to bottom right. So the most critical information should be displayed in the top left where we have the most attention. Because we're reading from the top left to bottom right, this creates a kind of detail gradient guideline. 
we should in fact have the less detailed, more important information in the top left where we'll immediately see it, and the more detailed, less important information in the bottom right for those details on demand. It's important to note, however, that this is something that is dependent on cultural context. These assumptions are about Western cultures, and if we were developing this report in the East, it would work differently. So we need to keep in mind the cultural context of our users and the business where we're developing these reports. So third, Clonk should also know that we shouldn't overload users with information. We should, in fact, have a concise information to ink ratio to be able to say more with less so that we're not immediately overloading the users with a whole bunch of graphs on a page. And related to that, the user should spend as little time thinking about what they're looking at as possible because we want the report to be clear and we want it to be accessible so that the user is really not thinking almost at all, if possible, and they immediately understand what they're looking at. So to summarize, we should use color to grab attention and use the implicit encodings that colors have. We should observe detail gradient guidelines to have the most critical information in the top left and the more detailed information in the bottom right. We should lay out our reports in such a way and design them so that we have a balance between the information and ink ratio and we don't overload the users with what we're displaying. Furthermore, we should make sure that the report is clear and accessible. We use good labels and we minimize the time that the user has to spend thinking about what they're looking at. So Klonk takes this feedback in stride. He's still very motivated and he's ready to design a better second draft. So he sits down for another meeting with our executive and she explains to him again. She says, okay, Klonk, the second time again, what I need to see are these KPIs I need to have a comparison to last year. This needs to be really visible, an overview. And I want to be able to have a split by all our important categories. Clonk, he, he nods, he adds a bit of extra questions here and there. And she reiterates, and let's try to follow some basic visual best practices. He agrees and he goes and back to his office and he uh, continues to work. He starts from scratch going from the ground up to design a second report. He comes up with a second version and he's convinced that it's better than the first. He struggled here and there, but he used a lot of resources available to better understand these best practices and to come up with a layout that he feels answers the feedback that he was given to begin with. So we as users should again be able to answer some questions. When we look at the report, we should be able to say, how much have we made so far this year? Are we doing better than last year? Like I said before, this is the critical information that we should be able to extract in three seconds or less. Based on the feedback of what we discussed before, we should be seeing this in the top left corner of our screen. It should be something immediate that calls out to us. So let's see if that's the case in the second version. We look at the report and we can see, ah, we've made 704,000 gold pieces so far this year good, but not as good as last year. In fact, we're not performing as well as last year, although we are shipping more units. But after those first seconds, we start to get lost. We don't know where to look. And that next part, those 30 seconds of filtering and zooming on what is important to us, it doesn't really happen. We expend a lot of effort just clicking on things and seeing everything filter everything else. There's a slicer at the top of the screen that has pictures of coins and steals our attention away. When we click on it, it changes the coinage, something that might be interesting for Clonk to develop, but is not useful for us in our business and how we work on a day-to-day -day basis. So this report, it was also rejected. It's not effective, and the main reason is that it has an unfocused and inflexible user experience. Specifically, the layout and labeling is improved compared to the first version. We're not completely overwhelming with red. We still have a lot going on, but in general, we can have those three seconds where we can pull out the critical facts. However, everything after that really overwhelms us. We don't know where to look, and there's not really a narrative of what this report is saying. It's more of a collection of charts than it is a report. 
in fact, the interactions as well that we use when we're clicking on things are not so effective because there's so many of them. Everything interacts with everything and we've never used a Power BI report before, so it just kind of turns us off of the experience. We can't really use it to take any value out of the thing that we're using. Next, the view is just inflexible. We need more detail than this, and we actually notice that one of our categories is missing. This means that Clonk is actually going to have to do further developments in order to meet all our requirements. So Clonk, he's ready to discuss this in detail. Like I said, he's a good sport and he's uh, ready to receive more detailed feedback. What should he do to improve? He should understand that very importantly, we need to try to tell a data narrative with the report. It should be uh, about the layout and interactions and thought out in a way that it's not just a collection of charts, that it's something that really speaks to a specific purpose. We need to test this with regular verbal walkthroughs with colleagues, peers, our boss, or even just some users to really explain to them the report and walk them through from A to Z. That will give us a good feeling as to whether we're doing this or not. Next, Clonk should know that when we use interactions, we need to make sure that they're intuitive and meaningful. We don't want to just pile them on to every visual because this will overwhelm the user, particularly if they've never used Power BI before. It can be very overwhelming if they're used to static reports to be clicking on something and have everything in the report change. Related to that, we have to make sure that the interactions bring flexibility. This is not only making our lives easier because then we have to develop less things if we just have some interactions and filters that can show the view, but it's also important that we show and tell the users how they can really do this because if we have all of these things in there, but we don't explain to the users how they can leverage it, then they're not going to be using the report in a very effective way. We shouldn't throw them in head first with a frequently asked questions page. We should really walk them through and show them what they can do in order to get that detail. So to summarize, we need to make sure that we tell a data narrative with our report, that it's more than just the sum of its parts. We need to make sure that when we use interactions that we use them sparingly and that the interactions that we have actually bring business value. And we have to be an ambassador for our report. We have to make sure that when we launch it into the organization, we explain to users how to use it and we give them a means to understand everything that we're using in order to help them get the detail that they need. So the executives, they say, all right, the second version, it's a bit of an improvement for the first. The whole experience has been valuable for Clonk, for the executives, for everyone involved, but our main stakeholder, she's really impatient and she wants this Power BI report and reasonably so. There's a lot going on in the business. So we decide to pick up a third party, a consultancy who says that they can design a good report. They show us a lot of impressive demos and some interesting things that they can accomplish. We have some discussions and it goes very well. It's going to cost a lot, 120,000 gold pieces, but we decide to bite the bullet. So we sit down and we explain, the executives explain again the requirements. They say, we need to see these KPIs, but we not only want to see them, but we want to be able to select what we're looking at. We want to choose between gross profit and net profit, and we want to switch between gross profit in value and in units. We want to be able to not only have an overview of how we did versus last year, but also the year before in an easy way in that three second overview. And we also need to have our categories, but this drill down, it's not working so well for us. Can we use some kind of drag and drop or some kind of selectable way of seeing what we want? Can we select these categories? And the, the consultants are enthusiastic. They nod and agree. And uh, they show a lot of interesting little technical demos. And so they start the project. The development, it starts going really well. Uh, they're delivering regularly and everyone's very enthusiastic about what they're seeing. They meet all their deadlines and they're ready to give a demonstration of the third report. Everyone's very excited. Stakeholders from the business and IT gather around to see what they're going to show. This is the demo that they showcase. They first start off by showcasing this three second overview 
where they do have this comparison to the last two years, as well as the three KPIs. Beneath that, they have this kind of tabbed layout, which is easy for the users to understand. They can just click on one of these tabs and then they're taken to an overview for that specific KPI, something that for them is easy to understand. They have a trend in the top right, and they also have a breakdown of their categories beneath that. It shows the year over year for the metric, and the user can also select the detail that they want to see, making it flexible and also giving them the control over what they're actually looking at in the report. They combined this method to create custom hierarchies in a matrix where the users can, in this case, look by key account and city, but if they want to instead look at key account, they want to look at continent, and beneath continent, instead of city, look at region, or instead of region, key account, they can effectively split the data however they need, giving them a lot of flexibility in terms of how they see the figures and helping them get those details in a very intuitive and easy way in just a single chart. So the visual in general, the report, it gets a, a lot of uh, support from those stakeholders. They're very enthusiastic about what they see. In general, they have that three second overview. They can filter and zoom on what's important to them in 30 seconds. And in those 300 seconds, they can use this table to pull out those details on demand. They showcased a lot of interesting things, a lot of tricks that they used in order to improve that user experience. Clonk was also in that demonstration, and he wants to know what kind of data alchemy they did in order to pull this off. So he sits down with one of the consultants who is very transparent about how they did it. And the consultant sits down side by side and explains how they pulled it off. Clonk asks him this metric selection. How did you do this? So you did some kind of measure selection. And for the comparison of last year, this the, you had some kind of tabs. If you selected the tabs, you went to a different view. How, did you do that with bookmarks or how did you do that? And how did you have the dimensions being selected with a drop down menu? And the consultant starts to explain some of the details, focusing more on the use cases, which is in fact what I'm going to do in this talk. I'll focus on the use cases and why this brought value to the report and when you would use it. But if you want to know how you can implement this for yourself in your Power BI report, I have on my blog, which is down below, data-goblins.com, uh, a technical walkthrough step-by-step -step with also examples so that you can try it out for yourself. So first, the KPI tab navigation. We are used to having tabs in various user interfaces, something that we see in other applications. It's something that just feels normal to us. So this is something that can be useful when we have multiple KPIs. We can have an overview in each tab, and then it's intuitive for us that the tab that's not highlighted, that we can click on it, providing a kind of guided user experience so that we are taken, in fact, to a hidden page in order to see more details, effectively drilling down and getting more information, doing that zooming and filtering um, and it gives us the feeling that we have a single page experience when in fact we're navigating to hidden pages, one page for each metric. So as a user, the experiences that we would first see on the page where this metric is shown, the gross profit, that the gross profit tab is highlighted. When we mouse over the other tabs like net profit or unit shipped, we're prompted to click which will highlight that tab as we switch the page to see the unit shipped overview. So what we see on the page is at first an overview of the gross profit. We click on the unit shipped and then the whole view changes and we see an overview for the unit shipped. Something that's really easy for us to understand and it's also just a nice way for us to be able to get those details. A next thing they did to add flexibility and also make their own lives easier was something that they called measure selection. So they explained to Clonk that this was something that was useful because they had to develop less reports and less charts because they could have the users actually explore the data, changing what was in the chart and reducing the amount of things that needed to be developed. What it did as well is it added them some little technical advantages. 
the consultant showed uh, Clonk that in fact you could do some additional tricks that weren't in the report. For example, you could use the measures as dimensions in a waterfall chart to show a breakdown, including each measure as each bar to a total. They also explained that it was good for their report governance. It made it so that they cleaned up the measure dependencies and reduced the total numbers of measures that were in the report file. It made it easier for them to manage and it made it just look a lot more professional when they did the handover and everything was pretty much self-contained. As a user, what we experience is we see that this measure selection is housed in this drop down on the top left. We see the gross profit and an overview of the gross profit in that page. If we select the drop down, something that we don't need to have explained to us, it's easy to understand. We can navigate toward the net profit. And if we select it, then all the numbers in the report will update to show us the figures for net profit compared to last year. Something else that they added to give that flexibility was also a dimension selection. They used the same kind of feeling as the measure selection, but then with dimensions so that users could choose the detail that they wanted to see. This was something that was intuitive to the users because they hadn't really used Power BI reports before. The drill down and using the arrows was something that they often forgot or just was a bit hard to understand. It was easier for them if they could just click the drop down and just select the layer that they wanted to get to. They could explore the data in a really convenient way, selecting the detail that they needed, and this would be remembered the next time that they were going to the report. It also was able to have them do some interesting tricks. For example, if they combined multiple dynamic dimensions into a single visual, they could have the users build their own dynamic hierarchies, something that in our organization is really important because we as salespeople think about all of these hierarchies, all of these different combinations of products and customers in different ways. So it gives us the flexibility to have all of this capable inside of a single report without having to request specific views. What we experience is we see a drop down of the continent, which is shown on the y axis. But if we instead wanted to see region, we could select this from the drop down, and the y axis would then show the regions. We change to show more detail and can easily select what we want to see. If we combine this into a matrix where each level is a dynamic dimension, some redundantly shown, what we can actually do is split the data however we want we can create our own custom hierarchies. For example, here we're currently splitting continent by key account to see those figures. But if we don't wanna look at key account and we want to instead look at a bit of a higher level at account type, we can do that. But if we want to shake up the hierarchy entirely, where instead of continent, we wanna see how the accounts are doing as a function of the account type, we can also change the top layer to select account type. Basically, we split the data however we want, and this gives us a lot of flexibility to be able to really have those details on demand in that last part of our experience. So again, if you want to know how you can implement these, I've written a blog post about each one of these things and also some more that you can find on my blog, as well as some PBIX files and other examples, so you can easily download it and understand or learn how to do it. So back to the demonstration. Everyone was really enthusiastic. It went really well. The executive particularly, she was blown away by the kinds of things that they did. Everything that she asked was in that report. It was in general, a really good meeting. Specifically, they had good layout and labeling. They followed all those best practices. The color that was used was really easy to understand. We could implicitly see where we were on target because it was green and where we were off target because it was red. Also something that we explicitly asked for. We could also have really flexible and intuitive interactions. It was easy for us to be able to use these drop downs to get the details that we wanted and to be able to split the view in a way that we could easily use. Next, the visuals were just very clear. There wasn't too much going on in the report. We had everything we needed and the focus was really straightforward. We had our three second overview in the left, 
we had then those zoom and filter experience in the middle and at the bottom we had this details on demand where we could select our own custom hierarchies in this matrix this details on demand table in general it fulfilled all the requirements and it added a lot of extra value our executive she really said you guys went the extra mile i didn't expect this it was it was really great great job so the consultants they're pleased they're pleased with themselves the they shake hands and go their separate ways the handover goes well as um, the dashboard is accepted the executives are very happy and we're ready to launch this report into the sales organization everybody's really excited some people even bring champagne um, but they're keeping their eye on the usage metrics, of course, because they really want to quantify how successful are we. I mean, we're all about data. But after go live, there is high usage by sales in the first weeks, but it completely plummets thereafter. Within two months, people are only going to the report to extract data to Excel. Why? Why are sales not using our report? This is the question on everybody's lips in that fateful meeting that becomes infamously known as the post-mortem. The coffee is strong and tempers are high as everyone's trying to figure this out. We bring in some of the salespeople, we ourselves go in to try to speak about this and, and they hear things like, ah, it's, it's too complex. I, I don't have time. I, I can't find anything. And I just, I don't think these numbers are right to which IT starts to respond back. The report was built to specifications. The demo went great. What happened? In fact, the main reason why this wasn't a success is it was designed and developed in a vacuum. It was developed away from the real users and it's not what they need because it doesn't support them in what they actually do. We need to go back to the beginning to have some user empathy and to do co-creation. We need to really understand who our users are and what do they do before we can even think about defining their pains and trying to build something that's effective for them. Because what we're really trying to accomplish here with all these things that we're making and all the things we're talking about today is we're trying to build a bridge between um, business and IT. We're trying to build a bridge between users and developers. We're more doing this with data, but how can we build something that's useful if we don't even know the person on the other side of the screen? If we don't understand their perspective and we don't know what they do, how can we possibly do that? But thankfully, Klonk gets one last shot. He's actually one of the people who brought this up in that post-mortem meeting. So, it's a good thing his charisma score is pretty high. He is going to have some user design workshops. He's going to start over and he's going to design for us a final version. He gets one last chance to do it. So he gathers up some of the users and he starts having these small meetings to try to talk to them, to define the personas, to be able to address the question, who are our users? He really goes and talks to them, tries to break down those barriers. He asks them questions like, how are we organized? Where are the users in the uh, hierarchy in the company? Are they tech savvy? Are the users using a lot of technology in their day-to-day -day work? Or is this report going to be one of the first things that they're really expected to use on a regular basis on a computer or a mobile device? What are their working habits? Do they typically only look at these kind of things in the mornings or in the afternoons? Is it something that they only consume on a monthly basis? Do they even have time to use reports? Are they always on the go visiting customers, only glancing at their phones to see that they have hundreds of emails, knowing at their hearts that they'll never answer even 10%? And if they have reports at all, how do they use them? Are these reports static views? or are they very interactive? Do they all just use the one table to rule them all? Klonk starts to define these things, and next he wants to refine them. He wants to not only know who the users are, but he wants to be able to understand what they do. 
he really observes them. He takes part in some meetings with customers. He goes with them on some calls and joins their meetings, their internal discussions within their teams. He tries to understand things like who are their customers? What is their strategy? Not only our strategy to sell to customers, but the customer strategy. Why would they buy from us instead of a competitor? And what do the salespeople think about that? What do they do with the data when they get it? Do they reshape it into completely different views, send it to the customer, or painstakingly make new calculations? Where are they wasting time? Are they collecting data from all kinds of different sources and painstakingly mashing it together into a single source for their team? And what do they feel isn't working for them? What do they feel is missing in what they have now? And of the things they have, what do they feel just doesn't work? Klonk starts to get some answers. He starts to collect all of this data, this research, and he starts to get a picture of who the users are. So the next thing he's going to do is he's going to set up a data design workshop. He's really going to work with the users and illustrate on paper how they see the report and try to get some of their ideas down. What he wants to do is he wants to do design iterations to really break down how they would see this data, what works for them, what seems to represent some of the ideas they have. And they don't even do that, but he also brings his laptop and they dive into the data together. Sales have some really interesting ideas and they test those ideas by just doing some quick data exploration, which reveals a lot of very interesting and exciting things. So thanks to this information, Klonk has gained some experience. He's leveled up his design. What did he learn? First, he learned that customers are billed after receiving products. For big ticket items, apparently it's possible that customers go a long time with payments past due. This is a huge frustration for sales who waste time chasing down these customers instead of new leads. He also learns that products can be returned and have warranties. They're not resold, so this of course has a negative impact on the sales figures. But the problem is that sales have no view on this process. In order to even start to get a picture of this, they have to painstakingly collect this data from the customers themselves and put it together, something where they waste a lot of time. Lastly, we know that sales haven't been going so well this year but the sales organization has been extremely busy. We have more orders, but we have less customers. This lead led to the executives really focusing on the customers and breaking them up into key accounts. But sales feel a little bit differently about it. The real people, the, the boots on the ground, they think that there's more of a problem with the products. They're wondering if the big ticket items aren't moving the way they used to, particularly after some of their discussions with supply chain. So Klonk learned some really valuable information. First, we have this problem with payments that are past due. We waste a lot of time for that. Second, we have no view on warranties and returns, which have a negative impact on our figures. And lastly, there seems to be an issue with these big ticket items. When Klonk actually works with sales to dive into this idea and test it out, they see that in fact, sales might be onto something and they might be correct. The result of their workshop is a, albeit very messy, but very different illustration than some of the designs that they had in the first reports. A big part of this little mock-up of this sketch, this whiteboard is dedicated toward these three things, pains which were completely missed in that initial requirements discussion. They really call out this past due when they see how much of it was, uh, was really existing. Sales are so shocked by how much payments are past due that they decide to make it a core part of their strategy short term. And they also decide to call out and bucket the items into high and medium and low profit. So this is the design that Klonk comes up with. What they do is when they work to really uh, dive into the figures, Klonk sees with sales that they had, in fact, 189,000 gold pieces in past due payments, something that completely blew them away. They decided to really focus on this 
and they had a breakdown beneath of all the accounts that had these payments past due so that sales could do something about it. Clonk also was shocked to see, as well as sales, the contribution of warranties and returns to their figures. 230,000 was the impact so far this year, something that before they had no visibility on. So they decided to call this out in a breakdown below. Lastly, the units that were shipped for the high and medium profit versus the low profit items were also bucketed separately. And sales were quite interested to see that their idea, their hypothesis was actually correct. So they decided to also focus on these high profit items and to have this be represented in the design. Clonk gathers everyone who was there at the last demonstration. A lot of the different business, the uh, executives, a lot of people from IT, and all of the salespeople that he's been talking with over the last weeks. He starts putting together the demo and he walks them through. What they see is, yes, they have this three second overview of how they're doing so far this year. They are not doing as well as last year, but they see that this past due payments are really called out because it's such a big impact and it's something that they're deciding to focus on. Beneath that, they have the warranties and returns and Clonk demonstrates that when you hover on the warranties and returns that it shows the customers. Everyone's quite shocked to see that Bards R Us has a pretty substantial impact on the warranties and returns. Beneath that, he has the same functionality for the past due payments, where sales can easily see what accounts are past due and what they're past due for. They can take a screenshot of that and send it to the customer to push them to be able to get that taken care of. Lastly, Clonk really calls out these past due pay or the uh, units that are shipped with the high and medium profit items. When he hovers to really see which customers are contributing to this negative movement of the big ticket items, we see that Bards R Us is again at the top of the list. The executive, the key stakeholder, she stops the meeting immediately and she tells Clonk to filter on Bards R Us in order to figure out what exactly is going on with this customer. A meeting that was initially a demonstration becomes a tactical as Clonk does just that. He goes to the dimension selection, he selects account, and then he filters on the account Bards R Us. And they start to have a very core discussion about what's going on at Bards R Us as the account manager for Bards R Us gets up and starts bringing up some of the frustrations and some of the things that he's been seeing as they start to discuss how they can improve their performance at this customer. So, Needless to say, it was a very exciting demonstration. People were very enthused by the kind of things that Clonk incorporated in the design, but it seemed very helpful. And this is really what set it apart from the previous designs. It had good layout and labeling. Yes, it followed all those best practices, but the key thing is we went from an overview to action with data. We had intuitive interactions that supported data storytelling. The report told the narrative and helped sales in really supporting them what they do. It wasn't what they uh, it wasn't what the requirements were just listing. It was really what they needed. It wasn't just ticking boxes. So to summarize, I've talked about a principle we can use when designing Power BI reports called the information seeking mantra. What this does is it provides us first a three second overview of the most critical facts in 30 seconds be able to filter and zoom on what's important to us, and in 300 seconds be able to pull out those details on demand. To do this, we have to leverage visual best practices to make effective charts and functional best practices to lay them out in an effective way and use interactions that bring value. Next, and more importantly, we have to have the user at the center of our design process by doing some design co-creation. We should really talk to the users and work with them to design something that's much closer to the target than if we were to be working in a vacuum. The key thing is that you can follow all of the best practices, but if no one's using your solution, then it's not a good solution. So I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for putting together this conference and giving me the opportunity to talk.
my buddy Alexander, who gave a lot of very useful uh, advice and guidance in putting this talk together. Also, my manager, Joris, who's taught me everything I know about data visualization and design. And of course, the references that I've used in putting together this presentation. Specifically, I want to call out the artists who have designed the uh, lovely goblin illustrations you see, Don Nero and the Art of Silent, as well as the other resources and references that I've used when putting this together. If you found this interesting, uh, the adventure continues and uh, clonk too, as he continues to battle other challenges in hypercare like bad practice, no governance and performance troubles. If you are interested in talking to me about these or other things, you can find me on Twitter or mail me. My contact information is available through the Datamine site, I believe. And if you're interested in becoming a data goblin yourself, uh, we are looking for fellow data enthusiasts uh, at our team in Ordina. So thank you very much. All right, Kurt, thank you very much. So right now the chat is blowing up a bit with people saying that you've done a stellar job. Um, and I have to 100% commit to this as well. It was really good, really informative to see. There are a few questions. So okay. are you ready? I'm ready. So Tom wants to know, for instance, why the deck of many things was on the desk? Uh, well, in fact, uh, the deck of many things we all know can be uh, throw in some very unexpected outcomes, <laughs> not only in your tabletop role playing games, but also in reporting. So <laughs> good question. Yeah. <laughs> and then Laura also wanted to know just the time frame ish kind of um, how long did it take you to craft a presentation? Because this is crazy awesome. Uh, I don't really know. It's just something I kind of chipped away at the last weeks. Um, it's been something that was really fun to make, especially collaborating with the artists. Yeah. Um, they they really did a, a great job in, in designing some of these things and sharing some of those ideas. Um, so I, I can't really put a hard figure on it, but it's been yeah. something that's been nice to work on. So. All right, great. So then we've got one question as well from Eric is, do you have any suggestions on further readings or uh, tips, tricks and guides for some best practices on data visualization? Definitely, definitely. There's a lot of really good resources out there. Uh, one book that I really like to call out is the big book of dashboards, uh, which you can Google and, and check it out. Um, I'll also post in the chat after the talk a couple other things that I have in a, a reference list somewhere um, so that you can also search them. So, But those are really nice things, not only to learn best practices, but also to be inspired and to think of other ways of visualizing things and representing data. All right, that's great. I added the link to the uh, big book of dashboards in the chat already. So that's good. Oh, so then, cool. Thanks. Um, boom, then we have a question from Jan as well. He wants to know if the isn't the cloak of elven kind meant to be stealthy? How on earth did Clonk realize it and notice it? Well, it is a <laughs> this, this this question and answer session is going off the rails as, as we uh, so yeah no the 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 if you're referring to the data set yeah so clunk of elven kind is in there the boots of elven kind as well so they're very expensive <laughs> many many gold coins okay good. many gold coins yeah so then one question as well from Chris is do you have any tips on improving the skills of users on how to read dashboards. Yes, um, so it's 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 uh, it's difficult, right? Because if you really put yourself in the perspective of a user, um, I mean, especially when you're implementing something like Power BI for the first time, it's a lot of change. And if they are used to working with Excel, if they've never had Power BI or interactive reporting before, it's it's a big paradigm shift. We can say it's not, but that's just not true. So we really have to go with them on that journey to really see it from their perspective and to walk them through, to help show them what they need, to involve them in the process. That's not only helpful for them because we're really empathizing with them and teaching them things, but that's also something that's helpful for us because if we can help people um, in the whole process, if we can involve them, then we'll see that, that these people actually start to evangelize the things that we're making. 
the reports become, for example, Chris's report, and he's really excited to show all these other people, and uh, it can really catch on in the organization. So I think engaging with people, communicating, and going with them on the journey is something that's important to do. Definitely, good answer. Uh, a few more. Elizabeth wants to know is, would you advise to include tables in some sort of an overview page on reports, or would that be too overwhelming? Yeah, so this is my personal opinion, um, but I mean, I've noticed that a lot of people have like a bit of a, a war against tables or something like they just don't want to have tables ever in any report. Um, but again, when we put ourselves in the perspective of users, if we just leap from an Excel report to some extremely complex, very visualization heavy thing with core diagrams and Sankeys and things like this, um, I mean, they're just going to be overwhelmed. So it can be a question of accessibility, uh, but it can also just be a question of what's the most effective and what's the simplest solution. Uh, something that's interesting to note is that actually a good tip is instead of using, I'll go back um, to the slide where I have it, um, but if you, you can actually use tables like here in the top left, this is a table actually, instead of like, KPI cards or something. So you can even use tables like that in an overview. But as we have down here, I mean, tables have their place in the report. Um, they can bring value. And uh, so, yeah, long winded answer. But yes, I think it can be. And that's my opinion. So. All right. Okay. Thank you for the answer. So there's a few people commenting as well is that the, the books of Stephen Few are an excellent read. Uh, I definitely, definitely agree with that. Uh, Alexander also mentioned that the Untruthful Art by Alberto Cairo is also a really good one. Yes. And yeah. personally, I do think that um, reading up a bit about Gestalt principles is really helpful as well for data visualization because they really help per me personally to see things in a different perspective as well. Yeah. All right. So that is all the questions we had, Kurt. Thank you for an awesome session. Alexander, do you have anything to uh, to add to that? This is the part where you unmute. Uh, no. So, no, Kurt, really, uh, this was an amazing session. I think everyone in the chat agrees. Thank you for the work that you've done on this. Um, and. Oh, you're free to go now. It's, it's